right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's just screw this talk. Let's just talk about Donald Trump, shall we? That'd be. Oh, come on. I don't care where you're from. That's funny. That's funny stuff. And it's always great to be introduced as the last person between you and Drake's. It's kind of like the first time I met my wife's great grandmother. Now I'm five, or I'm six foot three, two hundred and sixty some pounds, and my wife is five foot one, about hundred and five. And Grandma Agnes is even smaller than Tammy. And the very first time that I met. Grandma Agnes, she looked up at Tammy and she looked way up at me and she looked at Tammy and she looked way up at me and she said, isn't he bigger than necessary? So, <laughs> so I feel like that being the last speaker of the day and I, I do make fun of today. Uh, yesterday we launched the uh, Think Big, Act Bigger, our, our brand new book and um, we were announced uh, the first day out that we're going into a second printing which is a pretty good deal. We had somebody actually uh, call up yesterday and order 80,000 books for their company which uh, knowing what the book's about says that they've got a lot of room to grow in that particular company which is pretty exciting but no matter what I do today I did about 28, inter 28 media interviews and did a bunch of satellite uplinks uh, talking about some of the things that are going on uh, uh, excuse me around the country and um, it was uh, everybody always the one thing they always want to do is talk about Trump which is always interesting and the fact that you know um, that he's running so it, it is kind of an interesting marketing exercise if you think about it and what he's doing and how he's doing it I just remind everybody who and some of you know me I saw Jody Rich out there from cred uh, congratulations Jody on the uh, anniversary and launch of the new product but uh, Jody knows I've been involved in politics having been a former United States Senate chief of staff and and a House of Representatives staff as well and there's a long ways to go between now and November and a lot of skeletons and a lot of closets uh, yet to go so it's going to be very interesting to kind of watch you know um I'm going to talk to you, and this is going to be difficult for me because I'm trapped behind a podium, and I've never been stable in one particular place, and I've already had eight double espressos today, so I'm pretty wired already, and so I'm going to have some fun today behind here, but no matter where I go, no matter what I do, especially when I'm doing the television stuff, everybody wants to come and talk to me about my days as a Fortune 100 executive at Kodak. Now, I left that company six years ago. But everybody comes to me almost without fail and asks me why did they go bankrupt last year. And I remind people they didn't go bankrupt back last year. They really went bankrupt back in 1975. In 1975, a gentleman by the name of Steve Sasson, an engineer for Kodak, a researcher in the research lab, sat in a room and he invented the very first digital camera. He took digital component parts and he made a camera, a digital camera which was about this big. It was a blue box. In fact, it was a blue sheet metal box. And he actually took a photograph, a digital photograph of a real photograph. I mean, to me, that was fairly ironic. So he took a photograph of a, a photograph and that was the very first digital photograph ever taken. He then went from executive to executive. He went to the C-suite, to all the folks like myself in the ivory tower on State Street and he went to executive after executive back in 1975 and he said to him, hey look, I've just reinvented the camera. I've changed the way that we're going to be doing the new Kodak moment. This is a new one, a digital version of it. And every single executive said, put it away. Put it away. They said, we don't make that. We're not about digital, we're a film company. We make a little roll of film and we make about 90% net margin profit off of that film, that little roll of film. You put that away, that will danger, that will put us in danger of losing all the profits that we have from that. And to me, that's the day that they went bankrupt. See, they failed to, to think big or act bigger. They forgot what they were in the business of. See, Kodak, if you think back, had the only product that people would actually run back into a burning building to save. You think about that, if your house is on fire, what would you do? What would you grab? Besides your iPhone, for a lot of you, although that would be on your body, it's the most personal device there is in the history of the world, the phone. Most personal device, you know where, you know where this phone is more than you know where your children are. Oh, you think about it. You're at the mall and lose your phone and your children at the same time. Which one will you go to look for first? Now some of you aren't making eye contact with me right now, so we know. You can justify that if you find your phone, you can go and call about your kids, right? But 
I know that to be true about that being the only thing that people would run back into a burning building to say. Back in 2001, some 13 years ago, or no, excuse me, 2001, 15 years ago, I was struck by lightning. I was in my house, lightning struck our house, came to the house and struck me. I'm out, can't hear, can't see. I wake up. As I'm waking up, my wife is running by with a box of photographs going, are you okay, right? Oh, come on, people, that's funny. I thought that was funny. <laughs> Just shows you where you stand. See, Kodak was never in the business of making film. They were in the business of making moments. Emotional technology. They might have used film, but the camera was a different way. They used to think big. Their problem was in acting bigger. See, it's not the lucky who win in the end, it's the relentless. And so what I want to do today is talk to you as marketers, as a fellow marketer, about how to be relentless. Because see, it's the relentless that win in the end. Because we truly have to change the way that we look at marketing. We truly have to change the way in which we act at marketing. We truly have to be relentless. We have to adapt change or we are going to die. And my belief is marketing is under siege right now. Marketing is under siege in order to be relentless, to drive change in organizations. And I'm not talking about change for change's sake. I'm talking about change in improving and adapting. In making something different, to make it a bigger, badder, bolder version of what you or your company is. To put a stake in the ground, as I like to say, to think big, to act bigger, to be leaders. Now, Use this as a good example. When I went to Kodak back in May of 2006, I actually showed up a week early. A week before they passed the urine test or anything, I jumped on a point. People, that's funny too. I, I, this is this crowd already. You guys are already thinking pina colada. I can see it on your face, right? And I'd, I hadn't even passed the urine test. I flew to Rochester. I showed up a week early. And in fact, I'm on the plane talking to this 25, 26 year old gal because I want her to ask me what I do because I want to tell her I'm the chief marketing officer of Eastman Kodak. So I start getting in a conversation, which is something I rarely do on a plane. And we're having this conversation and she's going on about herself, yada, 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 like I want to hear any of that, blah, blah, blah. Finally, she, she stopped and she turned to me and said, well, what do you do? I said, well, thank you for asking. I said, I'm the chief marketing officer of the Eastman Kodak Company. And she turned to me at that time and said, who's that? <laughs> True story. Well, I wanted to test the mettle of my team. Now, I've bought and sold over 250 companies in my career, over $25 billion in transactions. And so whenever I step into a new business, and I was stepping into a new business, having sold them a couple billion dollars worth of a company before, and I wanted to test the team because I had some roughly three or 4,000 marketing people at the time working for me at the company, managing a budget of about 17 billion and I wanted to see what they were like. So I started calling the meetings together and I got to a room where there was a clock on the wall, much like this clock. And so I got there early and I stepped up on a chair and I moved the clock ahead by about 20 minutes because I wanted to see what would happen when people came into the room. And as they started filtering in, they looked at the clock, looked at their watch, looked at the clock, looked at their watch. They started asking, what time do you have? What time do you have? And then they would start saying, well, the clock's wrong. There's something wrong. We can't work like this. This is crazy. How are we expected to do things if the clock's not correct? If we can't, and then it went on. And I finally said, stop, move on. What do we care? Move on. And every day, day after day, same teams came in, same conversations, looked at the clock, looked at their watch. Finally, someone said, hey, yeah, we've organized a little task force. We're trying to find out who's in charge of the clocks. And we've called up departments. I mean, this is what goes on in big companies. And finally, I just said, why doesn't someone just do something about this? And a woman got up and she went over to the, to the wall where the clock was and she pulled a chair and she hiked her dress. She stood on top of the chair and she changed the clock. I named her my chief of staff for the very next day. She's running a billion dollar company today. See, that's what we're looking for. As leaders, as a chief marketing officer or a C-level executive, I'm looking for clock changers. I'm looking for leaders. I'm looking for people who see things that need to occur and need to happen and they happen, they do, you do. 
One of the new rules in my company, now that I'm out and I've started the C-Suite Network, C-Suite TV, and all the other entities that we have, we have a public relations company called Tallgrass that we bought and own. Tallgrass stands for if you want to run with the big dogs, you got to learn to piss in the tall grass. We only work with high growth companies. So we look for big dogs in our company. That's what we call everybody that works in our company. Are you a big dog? Because big dogs, they move fast and they're loud. We had a young woman working for us by the name of Caitlin. I'm about to leave to go over and meet with the CEO of a company that we're about to take company, take public. Last year we took three companies public. Before we leave, she stops by my desk, brand new employee, and she says, Jeff, do we need to take color copies of the presentation with us to the meeting? And I turned to her and I said, Caitlin, you're new here. So here's the rules. You only get to ask me 21 questions. 21 questions. I said I came out of that with a flashlight right out of my rear end. 21 questions, that's all you get to ask. That's all you're allowed to ask. You can ask me about the meaning of life. You can ask me about, is the A train the best train to take across town? Where's the best Italian restaurant in New York City? You can ask me, do you, what do you think of my boyfriend? You can ask me any question do you, that you want. Is that one of your questions? And she turned back to me and said, I don't think so. I said, good career move. Because if I have to answer that question, what do I need you for? Now, I'm not saying that to be harsh or to be rude or to be mean. But see, I hired Caitlin because she's a big dog. I told her, I said, Caitlin, I said, you're a superstar, a soon-to-be superstar. I picked you out of a presentation where you were tweeting and you were interactive when no one else was interactive in the audience two, three weeks before I even made the presentation. You were active online, interacting and engaging. You stood out. You are a big dog. You are a superstar. You're a person that's going to be taking my position right here in this chair. You'll be the leader of this company. And you're asking me a question that you already know the answer to. I said, let me ask you another question. Let's imagine I said, yes, we're leaving in exactly two minutes. Do you have time to make the color copies? And she said, no. And I turned to her and said, never ask me a question like that again. I can tell you that in management meetings, in meetings all day long, questions come up like this again and again and again. And we already know the answers. Yet we seem compelled to have to bring it out, to not, not act bigger, and that's what you have to do. Recently, I was taping an episode of the C-Suite with Jeffrey Hazlett, our primetime show. And I was at a company called Life Technologies. Life Technologies uh, was a merger of two different companies, bought up 48 different biotech companies, grew its revenues over the last four or five years to about four, three or four billion dollars. I'll, I'll rough it up to about four. And then they were selling to Thermo Fisher for $13.3 billion. While they were going through that transaction, I wanted to go and visit with them about that particular transaction and what they were doing with the mapping the human genome. And I'm with the CEO of the company, Greg Lucier. Now, Greg Lucier was a number of top lieutenant at GE, GE Medical, came over from that company and led this acquisition, led the merger, and then led the sale of the company. And while I was with him, he was speaking to a group of Harvard MBAs, business students, our former business students that was the alumni of the Harvard MBA program in San Diego. And he was going through his slides, and we're actually filming the presentation because we wanted to have some B-roll and we could shoot some extra shots of me sitting at the table and so forth. And we were watching him and listening to him. And he put up a slide and it said, leaders must be irrational. And I thought, what the hell? So I wrote that down, irrational, question mark, exclamation point, exclamation point. Are you nuts? What leader wants to be irrational? I think, I'm thinking, I'm going to grill him. I'm going to drill him in front of the camera. This is unbelievable that he said something like this. Be irrational. If anything, leaders need to be rational in the middle of all the chaos, in the middle of the growth and everything. And then he said, sometimes leaders say, here we are at point A. And we've got to go to point B. But you know what? As leaders, we have to tell everybody we're going to C in order to drag everybody in our company to point B. And then I got it. Sometimes we do have to be irrational. And in order for us to act bigger, 
and deliver that bigness, we have to be irrational. As a marketing department, you have to be almost like the brand Nazi about what it looks like, the attributes of the brand, the way in which you're going to deliver customer satisfaction, or maybe it's about growth, or maybe it's about the net reali the NNR, net realized rate, or your margins, or your speed to market, or the number of products that you have to deliver, being irrational. And then we have to be valuable. Valuable. See, in the C-suite, we're looking for people who are problem solvers, not problem seekers. I don't need you coming to me and telling me problems. I get that all day long. Hey, let me tell you a problem. I would love to sit in the C-suite sometime and actually have someone bring me an answer. I call it the Tycho Syndrome. T-Y-C-O. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Because they come in like we've never heard this problem, never seen it. What I need is people who solve problems, who are change agents for the process, who are cheerleaders who reinforce the goal. Not that the fact that you've, you drink the Kool-Aid before we ag agree, but once we agree, you drink it by the gallon. And last but not least, be seam operators. So let's talk about why companies fail. And what we need to do to be able to drive difference. One of us is that we're, f we're afraid. We're human beings, we are afraid. It's like the first time you've ever stood on a high, a high dive and you've, I don't know about you, I'm scared to death of heights. If I wear two pairs of socks, I get a nosebleed. People, this is the best shit you're gonna hear. This is it, right here. <laughs> this, I know, come on, let's get the caffeine. Maybe turn the lights up here. Give me, give me an amen. amen. Oh, you suck, you guys sound like a... Bunch of Lutherans. Lutherans live in constant fear that someplace, sometime, somewhere, someone's having a good time. <laughs> I ask you for an amen. No one to hear an amen. Pretend you're Baptist, or if your name's Goldstein or Old, you know, Feinstein, give me an oy vey. I don't care. Give me an amen. amen. That's it, brothers and sisters. Don't be afraid. Amen. That's it. Oy vey. All right. There's one of the tribe. What's right there? You've, we're afraid. We're scared to death. It's a common occurrence, but I'm here to tell you that the fear only lasts one or two seconds. Because I'm going to talk to you about making and taking risk as marketers. We're afraid to take risk. What's the worst thing that's going to happen if you make a mistake in marketing? Maybe a paper cut. We have to learn to take risk and drive risk. And then we have to create tension. That should be our job to become the chief tension officers of the company, to move everybody from the center of the stage to the very end, to the very edge. And you're going to have people in your company that are going to drive you to, to come back to the center of the stage where it's, where it's nice and safe. Over here, you know who those people are. Legal. <laughs> HR, those sneaky bastards, right? They're going to drive you and say, hey, what we need to do is drive to the least common denominator. We've got to be inclusive. No, you don't. Our job is to create tension. Our job is to go to the edge of the stage. Their job is to make sure we don't fall off. There's a saying in sports, no pain, no. Then why don't we have tension? And the one group that needs to be driving tension in business is marketing. All the time, full bore, never let up. This is where you must be irrational. And at the same time, you have to be transparent. Let me give you a great example of transparency. Recently, I filmed an episode with Domino's Pizza. I'm watching a commercial at, late at night. You've seen this commercial. It comes on, and Domino's Pizza starts talking about our pizza tastes like cardboard. It tastes like shit, basically, was the marketing message. How many of you have seen the commercial, right? You've seen it? Oh, people, some of you got to get out more often, OK? <laughs> So the commercial came on, and I'm thinking, who in their right mind runs a commercial, spends their own money to say that their product tastes like cardboard? And so the premise of my show, the C-suite, is I go into the C-suite, I see something, and I ask them to sit around the table, almost reenact what happens, and please tell me what happened in that conversation. I want to know who raised their hand in the middle of the board meeting, in the middle of the C-suite, the executive meeting, and said, whoa, 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 whoa. I know we're talking about how good we are, but I just want to say something. We suck. <laughs> and we suck so bad that we should spend money retooling our product, and then we should go tell the customers that we suck, and now we've changed. 
And so my first question is, the guy that stood up and said that, is he still there? All right? Which he was. And then second, let me see if I got this right, Mr. Chairman. You are going to fundamentally change the brand promise. He said, oh, no, we're not. I said, yes, you are. I said, the brand promise for Domino's for years has been 30 minutes or it's free. You cared more about getting me the box than what was in the box. And now you're telling me you're going to care more about what's in the box than the box itself that's changing the brand promise. And that's indeed what they did. And then they went out and told customers about it to reinforce. I mean, come and think about it. How many of us used to call up after we'd gone out at night in the college dorm room? 11, 11.30, we'd be back in the room or whatever, or we've watched Benny Hill or something, or we've been playing some kind of game and we're in the thing and we call the phone. And we look at our watch immediately after we hung up the phone just to see if they would be late so we could get a free shitty pizza. <laughs> right? And they changed that. And you see what they're doing today. They're being transparent about the experience of when you call on the phone about how bad it is to order a pizza. So they're saying, don't call, order it with our new Favicon. Order it this way. And what do they do that for? Mostly because they save a lot of money. A dollar to a dollar fifty per order by you ordering yourself. And if you screw it up, it's your fault. And risk. We have to learn to take the risk. I was in one of the biggest fights I've ever been in, in one of the biggest fights in business. You remember, it. at Kodak, years ago, we took on Big Ink. Big Ink. Now, I can't say their name because there's attorneys in the room right now following me around everywhere I go. So I can only refer to them as Big Ink. You know who I'm talking about. Big Ink. They made $9 billion last year alone just off of inkjet cartridges, inkjet cartridges, ink, ink. Nine billion dollars of net profit off of ink. Basically their model was take the printer off the shelf for free and you lock up the inkjet cartridges behind the counter. You know what I'm talking about. The only model I know that's like that is here's the free crack pipe, right? You get my point. Now we know where the depths of the screw room now at this point. And so we decided with the margins in that product, we were going to get into this, into this business and we would charge a fair price for the printer and half price for the ink and we'd still make a killing. Ink. I'm watching the news. In the news last night talking about the price of oil. They should talk about the price of ink. <laughs> when, the, when gas was at four bucks a gallon and you had a 20 gallon tank and you filled up your tank, it was 80 bucks. You were outraged. You're going, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? 80 bucks to fill up my tank? Do you know what it would cost to fill up your tank with ink? <laughs> Come on, guess. 20,000, 20, not even close. $462,000. <laughs> now at Kodak, I was only going to charge you half that. Because we cared. Right? So we're in this fight against Big Ink. I'll give you their initials, HP. So, <laughs> didn't want to say their name. Uh, so we're in this fight with Big Ink, and I, we needed to show the decadence of the model, to take risks, to be edgy, because we had to move the needle. And I knew that every time we, we pointed out about pricey ink, we could move the needle, and people would get it. So we decided to launch a commercial with a, a mobile campaign. This is back in 2008, when nobody was doing mobile campaigns. I said, let's do a mobile campaign. They'll write about it. It'll be ingenious, and the, the creatives were out the door. And so we hired Vinny Pastore, and we we're going to do a commercial that shows in front of motion picture theaters, because we were going after what are called high creatives. Creatives are those people that use four to eight times more inkjet cartridges than the normal user. I didn't want the regular person. I wanted the creatives. The creatives. The people that make things all the time. That's all they do. They just are very creative people. They use up a lot of ink. So we can move to profitability three times faster than normal if I could just hook that audience. So that was the audience. We found out they like to go to motion pictures. They love their phones. They love to be interactive on the phones. We're going to do a mobile campaign that's going to be at the theaters. You walk in, see the commercial, and then you text us a number and you get 50% off of price of ink. That was what it was. So we hired Vinny Pastore. You remember Vinny? Played Big Pussy on The Sopranos, okay? 
Yeah, because who better to show the decadence of the model than a, than a gangster, right? So imagine what it was like. Vinny pulls up on the East River outside of New York in a black Lincoln Continental. He gets out, he's wearing all black. He's wearing a black leather coat, black pants, carrying a baseball bat. He walks around to the trunk, he opens up the trunk. He looks inside the trunk at what you think's the body. The camera shot's looking up at him. He's facing the camera and he says, you've been lying to us, you've been cheating us, you've been robbing us blind. The family says, you've got to go. And then we show a shot of an HP inkjet printer in the trunk. <laughs> he takes it out, he puts it on the ground, he beats it with a baseball bat. He takes what's left, wraps it with a chain and a cement block, and he throws it into the East River. He gets back into his Lincoln Continental, puts his arm around a Kodak printer, and he says, welcome to the family. Because we have to show that we're a little bit decadent ourselves because we're charging a shitload of money for this product. <laughs> and then the headline says, don't get whacked by high inkjet prices. Text this number and get 50% off of pricey ink. We tested it as marketers. It's what we do. Double digit response. I told everybody to stop testing. We got enough. Let's go. Let's go. Get it out nationwide. So that weekend we put it out nationwide. Spent millions of dollars. Put it everywhere. I'm rushing around watching people watch it in the motion picture theaters. They're laughing, unlike this crowd. They're laughing. <laughs> They're enjoying the spot. They thought it was unbelievable. So I can't wait. Monday morning I sit down at my desk waiting for them to bring the sheet of paper with the number of texts that we got over the weekend. They bring over the sheet of paper. I pick it up. I look at it. On there is the number two. I said, what do you mean two? Two million, we got two million text over the, two million for this campaign, is that what we got? They go, no Jeff, two. I go, come on, we can't get two, we, we tested this, double digit. I said, even people at Inbound would find this funny. I mean, are you talking to me? This is unbelievable. <laughs> all we got is two, two? And they said, no Jeff, that's all we got. I pulled everybody in the room that had something to do with the campaign, about 30 people. I said to them, I said, look folks, holding up the sheet of paper. We got two, two, that's all we got. I can tell you right now, we spent millions of dollars on this campaign. This is not a good rate of return. <laughs> I'm gonna have to stand between us and the board of directors. I'm gonna stand with the chairman. I'm gonna have to explain why we did this campaign and all we got was two texts, two texts. Someone better start explaining to me right now what went wrong, what went wrong with this campaign? Why, why? We had double digit response on the testing and now you're telling me all we got is two texts? Someone explain to me why. Finally, a hand goes up in the back of the room. I said, what? They said, Jeff, what do you do when you walk into a motion picture theater with your phone? What do you do? You turn it off. I said, where the hell were you when we were coming up with this campaign? <laughs> it's an absolutely true story. True story, I wish it weren't. And I turned to the team and I said, first of all, my bad. I'll take responsibility, it was my idea. Second of all, where was the transparency of my team in talking to me about the fact that that's what they would do. We didn't think that through. Someone did, but you didn't say anything. But more importantly, no one died. <laughs> made a mistake. Made, made a big mistake. <laughs> I spent a lot of money. Gotta explain that. Now what are you gonna do to help me get out of it? And that's what we did. And we turned it into a digital campaign, and that year we grew the percentage of the business by 1,247%. So, my advice is thinking big, acting bigger, make mistakes. Be relentless. It was a great idea, executed poorly. So we had to re-execute. In my new book, Think Big, Act Bigger, I went out to friends and I crowdsourced over two pages of excuses that people used to give to me. I remember one time I came in on January the 2nd into the office, I saw a great campaign, I said, you know, we should do something like this. I think it's only cost us about 20,000, we should do that. I told the team that. It was January 2nd, our fiscal year started January 1st. $17 billion budget. And someone said, we can't do that. And I said, why not? He said, it's not in the budget. Are you kidding me? 
This is January the 2nd. Is your budget that well baked in the $17 billion budget? You can't find $20,000? Why don't you bring your budget in here and let me start going through it? We have to make choices. If you're going to act bigger, you have to make choices. Some of you even saying right now, personally, I'd like to spend more time with my family. Why aren't you? I'd like to do this campaign. Why aren't you? You have to think big, but act bigger. You just have to make the choices, that's all. That's what I think great leaders do all the time, is we're constantly making choices. And more importantly, we're making promises. Mutual conditions of satisfaction is what I call them, whether they're in my personal life or with a vendor or with my customer or with my employees or my team members, I make promises. It works like this. You pull up to McDonald's. Most of you have been to the American Embassy. You've seen it. <laughs> you pull up to McDonald's. You order something through the drive up. You pull up to the first window. You make your order. You pull up to the second window. You pay your money. You pull up to the next window expecting to get your food, but it doesn't always work that way, does it? No, it doesn't. Sometimes they come over to you and they tell you. They said, I'm sorry. Your order's not quite ready. If you'll pull right up over here to parking purgatory, we'll bring your food out to you. Right? Has that ever happened to you? You know why they do that? I'll tell you why. Because clowns lie. That's why. They're evil, sadistic little bastards and they lie. Okay? And you need to fight back with me. You see, because they made a promise to me. They make a promise to you when you go through and place your order and you pay your money and you're supposed to get your food, but they come over to you and say, no, pull right over here. And when they do that, you've got to do what I do is I turn to them and say, no, thank you, I'll wait. And I roll my window up. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is what happens. Pretty soon, the 14-year-old assistant manager comes over and knocks on your window. <laughs> Said, sir, I'm sorry, if you don't pull forward, you're going to hold everybody up behind you. And I go, I don't mind. And I roll my window back up. <laughs> Pretty soon, the 16-year-old manager comes over and knocks on your window. And said, sir, is there a problem? Yes, there's a problem, young man. You see, you made a promise with me. I gave you my order, you took it. I gave you my money, you took it. I pulled up to the window expecting to be delivered, get my promise fulfilled as you have outlined it to me earlier, and here I am to get my food, yet you're asking me to pull over here to parking purgatory, and you're not renegotiating the promise. You're not changing it. You're just telling me to take it, and I'm not going to take it. And unless you give me one of those minty shakes I like or one of those apple pies, I am not pulling up there and I didn't see you offer it, so therefore I am staying right where I'm at and I roll my window back up. <laughs> now when I go through McDonald's, boy, let me tell you what happens. I shout out my order, they take it, I pull up, I give them my money, I pull up to the next window, my food is thrown through the window into the car. <laughs> That's driving promises. If any of you have ever had children, or have them now, and if you've ever made a promise to take them to Disney World, try to back out of it. See, that's the way we should treat promises in the building, or in the office, or in the business, or with our spouses. I made a promise. Now, if I'm going to change my promise, I'll renegotiate it with you. I made a promise that I was going to deliver this campaign with this kind of results. That's what we sign up for, to be real, to be authentic. Mutual conditions of satisfaction. That's what we're here to drive. That's what real leaders and people who act bigger, people who are relentless do. They deliver on promises. I'm going to leave you with this. Think about why you're in this game as a marketer. What it is you're supposed to be doing. Or, let me speak to you as an individual a professional. What are your personal conditions of satisfaction? What is it that you want? What is it you want to drive? See, most of us don't really think through that. We go about our jobs or move from job to job or place to place or campaign to campaign rather than thinking about what are the mutual conditions of satisfaction. For me, I, I have three sim very simple ones. I'm driving wealth for me and my family. I am driving um, learning in terms of finding and doing things that are new and interesting for me. You know, constantly people say, well, why don't you come back and be a CMO? I don't want to do that. I already did that. Why don't you do it for a Fortune 100 company? I already did that. Why don't you do TV? That's interesting to me. 
and now I'm doing other things, and my team knows this is what turns me on. And the third promise that I have to myself is it's got to be fun. And if it's not those three things for me, I am out of there so fast it'll make your head spin. Now sometimes I stay a little bit longer, like at Kodak. I was only going to stay for two years, I stayed for four. Because the average length of a CMO at the time was 18 months, now it's grown to four years, uh, which is great to be able to see. And then, who are you? What is it that you can say about your company? Someone sent me something earlier today about what they do, actually for a speech I'm doing tomorrow, and asked to meet with me, and I could not figure out in that line of text what the hell this company did. So what's your 118, your elevator pitch? Now I'm from South Dakota, a place that most people only know on a, on a map, all right? And we're pretty plain talking folks. So if you give me an elevator pitch, the tallest building in our state is nine stories tall. It better be fast. I call it the Moses rule. Moses had two PowerPoint templates of five bullet points each to present his case. And you should be, able, oh, come on, that was funny. That was really, <laughs> you guys are all thinking, oh, he said Moses and religion in the same way. Okay. I call it the 118, 118 seconds. Eight seconds is the hook. Eight seconds is the thing that gets my attention. Eight seconds is then sales parlance, that lean in factor. What is the one thing you can say to me that makes me want to lean in and hear the rest? And then 110 seconds to close, to give me the value statement. Not so much time, eight seconds to get the attention, 110 seconds to close, 118 seconds, that's a new elevator pitch. And I know that you're passionate about what you do. I'm passionate about the things that I do. I'm passionate about, I love pheasants. Pheasants, the state bird of South Dakota. I love to watch pheasants run around, ringneck, Chinese ringneck pheasants, official bird of South Dakota. It's got a little white ring around its very plumage is very bright and long tail feathers and I love to watch them run around the ground and then I love to get a gun, hunt them down and kill them. <laughs> in fact, in three weeks the pheasant season begins and I can't wait. I was so passionate at pheasants that I started a pheasant farming operation. I had over 3,000 acres of pheasants. 3,000 acres of pheasants and I I, I put up pens the size of this room, the size of football fields, and I put telephone poles around the fields, and I covered them with nets and, so that the pheasants could run around and be free before I killed them. <laughs> and one night in South Dakota, I had a torrential thunderstorm that developed. And we, as we normally have in the, in the state of South Dakota, we had like three inches of rain in less than 30 minutes came down, and and I had 10,000 pheasants huddle up into one of those pens and they looked up into the sky. And they opened their little beaks and they drowned. These are the stupidest fucking birds <laughs> on the face of the earth. In fact, you don't know what it's like, right? You know what it's like to chisel 10,000 little names on those little things? <laughs> the graveyards are deep with the companies and people who do not think big and act bigger. It takes more than just passion to drive your company. So I implore you to think big act bigger, to be relentless, to be the biggest, baddest, boldest version that you can of yourself and of your company. Because if you don't, no one else is. I want to thank you guys very much. I, I'm, I've got so much more I'd share with you, but we're running short on time and I want to. Ooh, that's a good one. Ooh, that was even better. Let me show you this. Take out your phones. This is the only commercial I give. If you take a picture of that or go to this launch site, I'm giving away, along with my friends from Glenfiddich, Vosage uh, Chocolates, from United Airlines, from uh, the Trump Plaza Hotel, Gotham Air, we are gonna give you a VIP celebrity experience. This is what you get. We'll give you two first class tickets to come to New York, a suite at the Plaza.
hotel. We'll pick you up at the airport at the Gotham helicopters and bring you into the city. You would be met with an Uber limousine, which will take you to your hotel. We'll take you to a five-star dinner. You'll go to a taping of Steve Colbert. You'll go to a play that evening. You will have a personal tour guide the following day. And all you have to do is go sign up and share. Think big, act bigger. That's what we're doing. We're having great success, tremendous success. Uh, we, our first book sold about 100,000 copies, or, uh, or excuse me, a quarter of a million copies. Our second book sold over half a million, and we're well over that, and we're the second day into the book already, and we're having fun. The first, I think, about 25 people who come up after the speech, they've made a few copies available for you. You're welcome to take them. I've already pre-signed them. I thank you, and I'll stick around for a few minutes. Thanks for coming.